What's really going on, everyone? Back again. I know we just dropped a episode just this week, but we are back again with a special, special episode. This is season four, episode eight of the What's Really Going On podcast. Before we get into it, be sure to follow us on all of our social media. That includes Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at WRGO Pod. Be sure to like, listen, subscribe, and share on all of our streaming platforms. That includes Apple Music, YouTube, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcast. Since this is a very Georgia-specific uh, topic and guest that we have, I'm going to talk to our resident Georgia expert, Henry Woods, to introduce our very, very special guest. Oh, as Noah said, we have a very special guest, Joshua Anthony. He's running for Georgia Legislature, so that's a big, big, big deal. Uh, we want to have him introduce himself. He's considerably one of the youngest people that will be uh, elected, uh, so that's a big deal. Absolutely. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hi everybody, my name is Joshua Anthony. I am a 21 year old uh, running down here in Albany, Georgia, House District 153. Um, very, I think it's one of the smallest districts actually uh, in our state. Um, and currently, I'm not currently, but I am the youngest person currently running uh, for office down here in Georgia uh, for our, at the state level. I'm very excited. Um, I'm a Georgia State student doing all my work online. I'm an economics major. Um, we're just trying to do the good work down here in Albany. Uh, making sure that we turn the uh, 229 into a, the true good life city that it was meant to be. I love to hear that. Uh, I'm from a small, small town in Georgia, not that uh, specific di district, but it's cool for you to be so young. Uh, like, were you always interested into politics or what like kind of prompted your interest? Yeah. So uh, funny story, actually, when I was younger, it's like, this is like when the, I realize how old I am now, but like when the, like the second iPad came out, um like my mom got me one of those and so like I would like go get it at nighttime and like go under my covers and be like I'm gonna be the president of the United States like six years old um but what actually ended up going as I got older um my actual what I wanted to do when I was uh younger uh was to be a zookeeper um and I was actually blessed enough to have the opportunity and actually work at a zoo for a little bit um but what ended up happening as I got older um when I about hit the age of 14, I uh, began canvassing, knocking doors because I was just like, okay, let me see how I can make a difference in my community. Uh, just because I was 14 and I wanted to do something to do, but it actually ended up turning out to be a passion. Um, and from there, from 14 of knocking doors to, to being, uh, you know, 16, understanding how policy worked, uh, writing my first bill at 15, <laughs> getting it rejected because it wasn't good. Um, but just like the experience I was able to build up through it. And then when I turned um, about, 17, 18, I became um, the first black intern for the city of McDonough. Um, and that was a very good thing for me to understand about how our local governments work, how budgets work. They allow me to sit on their budget meetings, understand how their budgets work, how are we supposed to allocate money and funds. And then through that time of, I would say, 17 to about 20, I worked heavily uh, with our state legislatures, which are uh, with our um, local representatives, our city commissioners, um, state and the state representatives and state senators, as well as our federal level, um, such as uh, was it um, Congressman Bush, Bishop and Congressman um, David Scott. I worked specifically under David Scott for a while, uh, I think for about a summer. Great opportunity. Um, very much so excited. Um, and I wrote my first big bill at the age of 19, right after, I believe, the Uvalde shooting. It was about 80 pages, and it was built specifically to increase gun safety across the state of Georgia, understanding that Georgia is um, a very much so conservative, you know, gun ownership state, um, even to the extent of saying me and myself, I believe wholly in the Second Amendment, but we have to understand that we have to have a line between um, protecting our children and protecting ourselves, and we can do both at the same time. We can walk in and chew gum at the same time, um, but that bill was specifically meant to ensure that our children would be safe moving forward, um, and unfortunately, uh, we didn't get, we got a lot of traction, but it didn't get passed. Um, and unfortunately, uh, I think right after that, um, that debacle, we had a, a, an issue happen down in Midtown. But that just gave me more hope and, and experience to get things done for our community and actually make some stuff done. And as much as I love Atlanta, um, this is my home. Albany, Georgia is my home. And I want to make sure that I'm building up Albany uh, as much as I can in whatever capacity. And now uh, at 21, uh, I'm not going to talk about what I did on, on like the statewide campaigns. But at 21, I'm, I'm blessed enough to say that my name's officially on the ballot uh, for the 2024 uh, primary. I love that. And I, you kind of touched on it that you've been kind of into politics your whole life. And I say your whole life and you're only 21, but if you're elected, you'll be the youngest person in this position. And I'm just curious from 
interning and having the experience, what was the switch for you to go from, I'm kind of okay with um, where I'm at and I want to be the person that's front running and not necessarily being in the background of being an intern or getting more experience? Um, that's, that's a great question, actually. Uh, so for me, the thing is, is that at some point I always felt like I would run for something. Uh, but the fact is, is that I wanted to make sure that I was moving on God's timing and not my own because selfish ambition can definitely not wreck only yourself, but the, the ones around you and you won't be taking care of the people around you because you'll be focused on yourself. Um, and so like I had no intentions of actually running in this election, uh, but the community here actively needed that and they were asking like Yo, the person who's sitting in this seat currently is not doing their job the people that are running for these seats are not the people that we want in these positions um and so from there i was like okay so what do what is what does this look like me running for office what does this you know me moving from being a organizer uh moving into the space of becoming a a, a front runner to run for office and just genuinely having those door-to-door -door personal conversations and you know as much as I talk about it uh you know we can have as many signs up as we want we can have as many campaign videos and, and 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 all this stuff but if you don't have that genuine conversation with the people in your community you will never actually know what they're looking for and the things that they said aligned perfectly uh in my community with what I was trying to get done in Albany and now we're in a space now where we're, we're walking chewing gum and, and a lot of the city uh if not 99% of the city is behind us in regards to what we're going to do uh once we get uh, not only through the primary, but in the general, but when we officially get in office in 2025 in January. That's, I love that, but I'm also curious about what has been the feedback on the ground when you announced that you were running and politics is always, a, in my opinion, an old man's game. So what was that feedback that you received on the ground that you're 21 and you wanted to run for office? Uh, so like the feedback from my family was just like, oh, you're doing what now? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, that was the biggest thing. It's like, it was a lot of like shockwaves. But in regards to being on the ground, uh, the people in my community, I when I tell you there was never a hesitation of, oh no, let's not do this. Let's not go this route. It was more like, we need this. Um, because I will say uh, our community uh, has a almost 30% poverty rate. Um, we have an extremely high, uh, high homicide rate. Um, and we have very low to no, let's be honest, no economic development. Um, and the ways that we've been going over the past 40 plus years, is not conducive to where we're needing to go forward. And so the community has been astoundingly behind this um this this race. And it's actually really insane because um once we qualified, uh, we've been getting a lot of support from people outside of the state. Uh, we have, you know, uh, uh like outlets like Black Enterprise posted me. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is kind of cool. Um, and then you know, we have um leaders like um attorney Crump. Uh, who also, you know, amplify our race down here. And, and, you know, this is something that we've never seen before. And obviously you'll have your detractors, but I feel like if everybody agrees with you, then you're doing something wrong. So I feel like we have to get into a space where we're actively promoting and pushing for a mindset of, 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 of ingenuity, actually getting things done because we don't have that development. And what we have to get into that development that kind of pushes us out of a way of, uh, of our pushes out of our comfort zone. Uh, and people of Albany have gotten accustomed to struggle and we want to make sure that we get rid of that so we can have a better tomorrow. When you're talking to folks, um, yes. you know, throughout Albany, and of course, I think to what Mackenzie was saying, it's not only just an old man's game, it's also largely a white man's game. And when you're kind of walking around the district and you're, a, you know, be frank, you're a 21 year old black man and you have a young face. What is kind of that initial reaction to where you're trying to say, folks, hey, I'm actually earnest and here are actually my policies take me seriously in what I'm talking about. How is that kind of, because there is a divide there, I would imagine in terms of trying to make sure that, you know, hey, I'm not just trying to do this just to do it, but like, I'm actually serious. Can you take us to kind of like what those actual conversations yeah. are like? Because I'm sure that it has to be something that you have to be very considerate of and aware when you're on the trail. Absolutely. So uh, the blessed, you know, one of the great things about Albany is that this is a 76% a, a black district. You know, we have a lot of, you know, that's a very big swath of, of our community. Um, but a lot of our counterparts, you know, our, our, our um, African, you know, our uh, Caucasian counterparts and um, Hispanic counterparts, just having those, like I said, just having those genuine conversations, um, we've actually been able to see something that, you know, again, that has not been seen in Albany. And that's uh, uh, an almost equal, not even equal, but a push from both the Republican side uh, and a lot of our white, you know, uh, um, white community members, as well as uh, a lot of our Democratic and, you know, uh, minority members actually 
coexist together in supporting this campaign. This has not, again, this is something that we've never seen before. Um, so we have members uh, that are historically voting Republican supporting this candidacy. Um, and the people who historically obviously voted uh, for Democrat are also supporting it. And, and a lot of our population, specifically our voting population, are seniors. Um, and, you know, that was always something that, I, you know, we were trying to, we were trying to figure out uh, is, you know, is to understand what I needed to do and how I can connect with everybody uh, at every level. And the overall, the overwhelming gist is that, uh, from my understanding, is that we need a young man. That's, that's, that's what we hear every time, is that we need a young man uh, to, 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 to represent our city, the ones that actively want to get something done. And I think the, the thing that makes things a little bit easier is that I do have the experience behind my youth. Yeah. I feel like if I didn't have that opportunity to work, you know, in these spaces with these, these leaders, is that they would have more skepticism. But because I do have this this experience and I'm able to explain to them uh, in a way that, you know, makes sense to them and that, you know, because everybody has a different language in which they speak, uh, you know, and that really gives me an opportunity to speak to them. So definitely um, because of that experience and me just having these genuine one on one conversations, explaining how this won't not just affect the African-American community here, but how this will affect our Caucasian community, how this will affect our, our Latin community, how this will uh, affect our um, our Arab community, how everything that I'm trying to do would ultimately be for the, the greater good for the city. Um, and everybody can be can partake in it. And it's not just a, a one sided uh, plan that we've seen all these last 40 plus years. Yeah, because I think the interesting thing is kind of I think when we were all kind of doing research was that obviously and you mentioned it kind of in your lead up when we first started was that, you know, obviously economic development was like the core focus of your campaign. You know, I don't live in Georgia and, you know, Henry even he's in Georgia, but he's in a different part of the state. So for those who are in your district, but also for those who are not, can you just kind of explain what the economic situation is there? Because I think that probably, Absolutely. you know, given that that's the core focus, try to explain, you know, how you see the problem and also kind of what you see as potential solutions. Absolutely. So um, regards to our economic development, for me, I have a five year plan. That's just for everything across the board. Uh, a five year plan allows us to have momentum and movement to what we can and what we can't do. And I believe that a lot of a lot of leaders and a lot of candidates do not have a plan, but they just kind of run on issues saying we want to get this done. But because you have a plan that gives you a feasible groundwork to actually, you know, gives you a map to get things done. And so in regards to economic development, for me, the ultimate goal is to actually provide industry here, um, understand that we need clean energy. And clean industry, we need to bring it here because all of our surrounding and much smaller cities are actively providing and bringing in jobs that we've never seen. Uh, for example, uh, just down in Bainbridge, uh, you know, family, you know, family grown is there, grown there as well. Is that you know, they have, um, though there's a lot of uh, controversy over it, um, they have a, um, I believe, a monkey breeding facility. Um, but the fact is that they are bringing in industry. Uh, to to their community and actually helping it grow, uh, and that's something that we can talk about on a, another day in regards to you know my supporting of a, you know that specific you know industry. But the fact that the matter is that there are cities around us laughing us, uh, laughing us, and we're the 14th largest city in in the Georgia, and we're getting lapped by our our counterparts because. We don't have the industry. We're relying on our, you know, our few factories, which we are blessed to have, but we're, we're relying on our few factories and our small businesses, which have so much red tape on them that they can't actually expand uh, and, and things like that. And so that's definitely something that we want to work on. So specifically for our economic development, what I really want to push on is the, is the development of our river. Um, because we have a river that is called the Flint River. It cuts directly through our city. I mean, down straight through the middle, if you've seen our map. Um, and we need to be, you know, it was used during the Civil, the civil War uh, for Confederates using to get the supplies up and down the river, uh, up and down Georgia. So why are we not using that to ensure that our um, our community is getting the best of its of its needs? Because we don't have I seventy five going through us. It was voted against a while back, years and years ago, and my people have suffered for it. So instead, we cannot rely on trying to get I seventy five to cut back through Albany. But what we need to do is look at the things that make us us and use that in our advantage. Um, because we have a water a water source, that's an attractive business site. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we have um, a lot of rural land, not only surrounding us, but even in Albany, that can push that can push for urban farming and, and clean energy um, and actually having things near here. Um, we even have the blessing of having a, 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 a military base here, um, two museums, a zoo and an aquarium. We have the things that we need here, but the fact of the matter is that it's used in, a, in an irresponsible way. We're not actively allocating funds to where it needs to be. Um, also with that, as I mentioned, clean energy. We have a lot of, we have a lot of land here um, and, and our utility rates are some of the highest in the state. Um, simply because we have been misallocating funds and people don't have the materials that they need. So if, for example, affordable housing, how do you boost economic development? If you have a place where families can actually reside and have a clean environment for them, that has that that, that lays the groundwork for having 
stronger community development because people are now investing their time and implanting their families into Albany. Um, and then great. even again, um, and I'm sorry, I got one more point, and oh, I yeah. promise you. <laughs> um, but even to the the, the point of uh, of affordable housing, I really want to make mention of actually our small businesses um, and bringing in our you know companies, companies that that want to have an investment in this community should have a workforce program um, to actually farm in our workers uh, and our community members. And so when they come out, or if they want to stay in there, they have the skills to stay. And if they want to leave, they can have the the skills to start their own business. I believe everybody in some point or another should have ownership of something that they create because it's theirs. They're good at this. Everybody has a different talent. If they're able to market it based off of the companies coming to Albany, we're consistently farming out our, you know, our, 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 our community members to actively build something for themselves uh, to actually build us in a way that, that makes sense. So definitely things of that nature, cutting the red tape on our small business so they can actually move forward in a healthy way. Um, and, you know, having that consistent support from the state um, and not just relying um, on on uh, on I would say pennies being thrown at in our city because we don't have the support that we need. Oh man, you are like, I, you are trained to go like on it. <laughs> you were made for the game, man. I really we I, I'm so proud of you. Um, and like I appreciate it. Thank you. Someone who's a bit older than you, and like I'm from Georgia. And I know Southern culture and people tend to be a bit like, uh, I'm, 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 I'm okay where I'm at. Com complacent. Yeah. Word. Uh, how do you feel you're engaging your peers in the city uh, and the, the support you'll need to bring the development and, you know, help the plans you have and like to intend to be in place uh, actually yeah. like go through and happen? Okay, so that's a great question. So for me, it really boils down to uh, forcing uncomfortability. You have to understand the position that you're in in order for you to understand how you can get out. Uh, and that's something that I kind of like to tell my people is that, you know, Albany has gotten accustomed to struggle. When you live a certain way for so long, you know, seeing another way out is scary. You know, you can't, you know, that's the fear of the unknown because I'm, I haven't been knowing anything but this. And so for us, in order for us to get to a better space to where people can be making $15 an hour, for where our students can, you know, feel safe to just go outside, for our students to actually have, you know, bring back, um, you know, trade schools into our high schools because not everybody wants to go to college. For us to be able to create a space for our families tomorrow, we have to ensure that we have that, you know, they have the information to the, at their disposal. And so, like I mentioned for my five year plan, you know, I, it, you know, if you, when you read it, you know, it's like five pages worth of economic development. You know, if, you know, reading all the way through, it's about a 20 page, a 20 page plan as a whole. You know, all of these things, you know, I try to squish it down, you know, into digestible bites for my community because, it, you know, that's a lot to explain to somebody in two minutes. Uh, but, you know, forcing uncomfortability is how we're able to get to this spot. For example, we have uh, um, Albany State down here. Um, actually, a lot of our students at Albany State are, are joining the campaign as of recent, even our high school students, uh, like a, a high schooler has currently been, um, you know, oh, what's the word to use, uh, designing my shirts, because we need to be actively getting everyone involved. I feel like that's something that we have lacked across not just Albany, but across the state of Georgia and, and the United States as a whole is that, you know, we look for certain demographics and then try to run away. You know, this is our demographic and this is all we're going to get. In order for us to work as a community, we need our seniors, we need our, we need our seniors knowledge, we need our young people's energy. You know, we need our and we need our, um, I would say at this case, our middle aged, uh, you know, uh, leaders. We need, you know, their support. You know, it's a it's a connection you know, of, of all three. And that's kind of how I've been building my platform in regards to how we're going to move is to ensure that we have the state funding. So our government is working to ensure that we have community and community is built through providing not only the information, but the time in your community. You can't just say, hey, here's how you survive a hurricane and just leave. You have to provide consistent incentives and support to have things moving. And then obviously, you know, alongside that is supporting our business. So it's a, a bit of a triangle of getting things done and they kind of reverse, you know, and, and work in one another, which is why I'm running on three issues because they all work to one another's uh, good. No, and if you, you hear my, if you see my dog pop in the screen, just ignore him. <laughs> so when you talk about forcing uncomfortability, I'm curious to what you think that that in your five-year plan, how do you think that that will land and impact some of your constituents if you are elected? Right. So uh, a lot of leaders, I would say, and we've all seen it, and, and I know it all makes us upset. They'll say, when I get in office, I promise. That's the problem. You promised. Um, so for me, I'll have a plan set forth. The reason I have a five-year plan is because 
I want everyone to understand that this is the plan, but there are potentialities of delays and detours because we're dealing with over a hundred different legislators. Then we have to deal with another couple of you know legislators on the Senate side. Then we have to deal with the governor and his team. Uh, you know, we have a lot of you no. Know, then we have millions of people in Georgia that all have different needs. You know, ultimately, my five-year plan is going to bolster Southwest Georgia, Albany, and ultimately Georgia. We have to understand that you know I can't afford to make promises. You know that 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 are that are very very difficult to to make promises on. But what I can do is within this five-year plan is hit these check marks that will push us to where we need to be. Um, like I won't sit here and say I promise we'll be at a fifteen dollar a min a fifteen dollar um minimum tomorrow. Because guess what? The moment I'm unable to complete that tomorrow. Now I'm on the hot seat and our community is struggling because they're now, they were ready to shift their lives based off of a promise. But now if I say we're going to make a, you know, for example, one of my plans is to make an incremental increase to, you know, from that 525, I believe in our state level wage to, to you know, trying to do a 10%, if not more increase on a six to, 10, uh, to a six month to 12 month basis, put out a bill that way that will forcefully bring up the, the, the wages to, to match inflation now we're in a space now where our families can not only keep track of their funds going up, but they're also able to maneuver based off of how we're keeping things moving within the plan. And we're all staying within this five year plan. And so that's definitely why I say, you know, with that uncomfortability is understanding that, you know, it's going to take time. But I don't want to say I will never lie to you and say that I'm going to get this done tomorrow. And now you're expecting me to do it tomorrow. We have to have an understanding and a level of transparency and truth. And I feel like we've missed that and lost that within policymaking um, because we've turned, you know, getting people, you know, changing people's lives into a space of entertainment. Well, there were a lot of quotes in that. I'm, just, I'm still kind of right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that's really, I think that's honestly probably like an approach that, you know, I'm sure in Albany, I think given how you're kind of describing the layout, I'm sure probably an approach like that is probably new and honestly fresh where i think people can probably appreciate hey this person's not stopping by when they need my vote promising me something and then going out in the middle of the night and never seeing it again it seems like you it seems like you're really reaping the benefits of kind of just being consistent but also saying hey here's where we are i'm not saying i'm going to change the minimum wage from this to this but like let's just have some kind of steady growth do you feel like people are receptive to that argument because i think there's probably a, a challenge in that politics now is yeah. entertainment and i think Sadly, right. you know your stuff really, really well. And I think probably yeah. for people to really get the breadth of your personality, and we've just talked for you for 15, 20 minutes, and we're super impressed. But how do you kind of like still try to give people kind of like meeting people where they are? Um, how do you try to cut that bridge? Because I'm sure that has to be hard when I think you're yeah. so detailed, so on it, and you're seeing something that other people might not. How do you kind of get people to see it your way, but also while trying to meet them where they are, if that makes sense? Um, so the biggest thing for me is that I feel like we we've, we've gotten to a space where we treat our voters and our citizens like idiots. Mm -hmm. They're not idiots. Everybody here, you know, a lot of people, these people have families, they have children, they have jobs, they're maintaining a budget. You know, they have actively gone through college. And if they haven't gone through college, they're finding another way to understand and learn. And I feel like that's what we've done. We've treated our, our, our community members as if they don't have common sense. And so what I do is I go to them, Dr. the door, I'm like, hey, how y'all doing? You know, and we have this conversation. And within this conversation, for example, I'll give you a story. Um, there was this, this, this older gentleman. He asked um, me, I knocked on his door and he was talking to me. He said, hey, man, no one's ever come to my door. And I said, well, why not? He said, no one's ever come knocking on my door or anybody in this neighborhood for all I know. Um, and he said that he has two autistic daughters and a son. And he said, no one's ever come to speak to me. And so listening to his story, I'm able to understand what he went through and how I can change and alter my plan to work more for everybody. And so I can explain my plan to you and they'll be like, OK, and this is something I, I don't I don't I don't believe that we do is that when someone tells you something like, OK, so how 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 do you think um, this, you know, how would you like for me to work on this for you? And now you're telling me that you want to have, you know, an, you know, an expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. I agree with that. And so now that I understand that you need more help on this front because we've had this conversation and you've heard my plan, we now can work on that. And I, I tell you, I'm like, listen, now I'll make sure I make this a, a priority of mine. But just know that it's going to take some time. <laughs> now, we're going to make sure that I, I'm going to make sure I prioritize this because guess what? This city has a little over 50,000 people in it for sure. At minimum, 50,000 people. We um, have lost population over the last several years, but we've had a, have a fairly decent sized population of people. Um, and then with that, 
when you're having these conversations, you, you have to understand the position of the job. As a state representative, you can't do what the president does. As a state representative, you can't. For me, when I'm having these conversations, oh, did, it, did it go out? All right, cool, cool, cool. Did it go out for a second? Okay, so uh, in regards to these preparations, uh, you know, for me, my biggest goal is to ensure that there's comfortability in the plan and understanding what we're going to do moving forward and how this will affect them. It's telling them how my plan will affect them and how I want to ensure that the plan, you know, stays within the realms of what it's supposed to do. Obviously, like I said, there's going to be personalities on the political side once we get to Atlanta in the state capitol, people dealing with, hey, I want to do it this way or I want to do it this way. And on that issue, we can figure that out. But at the end of the day, if I'm able to deliver and have a tangible response every single time I come back to my city, which is going to be often, it's not going to be like a, hey, I'm in Atlanta now. See you guys when it's time for election. No, when I'm in Atlanta I'm, and I come back home, I'm going to have you know monthly town halls so that people know what's going on in the community. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to make calls, you know, things of that nature to actually keep people informed. And that's like just that's just half the battle is information and understanding how we're going to move moving forward. So that's a big thing for me. And I think probably that would, uh, you know, as someone who works in politics, I'm in D.C., but I think that's honestly an art of kind of engaging with actual constituents that's honestly really lost in terms of, you know, you mentioned the beautiful story of the gentleman who had two autistic daughters where that person actually probably knows more about Medicaid than you and is saying, hey, what, you know, like, what was your hiccup? Tell me where the problem was so then I can be the linchpin to saying, hey, you were here and you got paused here. I actually think that's, honestly, very humbling approach to it, where I think you're admitting that, hey, this other person, they're more aware of something. And I think, you know, whether it's a business owner who's saying, hey, what, you know, you're asking them, what's the red tape? Where can I be helpful? I think that's probably an art that's lost, where I think we probably just say, oh, I know what's best, you know, in terms of solving Medicare, even though I'm not on it. I think I actually really think that's a really refreshing approach. And I'd like to think that people would be able to be receptive to what can I do? Like, how can I make this thing better, even if I want to build something out? But like, how can I just do, do this better? And I think that's honestly a really good approach. I appreciate it. That's definitely a big thing for me is regarding to understand that, you know, I don't know everything. And as much as I would like to know everything, it's great. <laughs> It'll make life a little easier. But people are built for different things. And so, for example, you know, like you mentioned, I might not know everything about Medicare. I'm pretty good at economic development. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's my jam. I like that. Um, you know, it's not the sexiest policy point, but dang it, it works. You know, it keeps people yeah. afloat. Um, but, you know, somebody might know more about education and I refuse to, 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 to hurt my community because of ego of me saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. You know more than me. <laughs> let's work together. Let's, let's talk about how we can make this work. It, it, tweak my plan and tweak what we got to do so that more people can, can be um, more effective. So that's definitely, I appreciate you for that point. I truly want people to understand that, you know, a lot of leaders, Though they may seem like they know everything, they definitely, you know, as as citizens, please reach out to them. <laughs> Give me a 10 cent. And as, oh, go ahead, Henry. I had to unmute myself, my bad. Um, I was just gonna say, like, this may be like a super obvious question, but um, considering again, like you're in the South. You know that it's going to take a, 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 a process to get where you would ideally like to go. Um, like what perspective do you think you're bringing to the state legislature or your constituents um, or just being in the realm of this political environment, considering the climate that's, again, heavily from the South? Uh, what perspective you think you're going to be able to uh, bring and then actually get some of these things pushed through um perspective wise obviously i could just i could i could have the cop out answer to saying my youth that's like the easiest thing i could ever say um but in all honesty it's actually um and i and i kind of hate to put it like this but you know true bipartisanship we have a republican dominated legislature you know this um you know we're you know we're beat pretty much on every corner um but the fact of the matter is, is that you can't tell me that there isn't a Republican that doesn't want economic development. You can't tell me there isn't a Republican who doesn't want, you know, educators supported, uh, you know, and have infrastructure. Now, there is, are there going to be people that actively want to be selfish and do, th do things that they want to do? Absolutely. But the fact of the matter is, um, from my perspective, is that we can agree on one thing, just one, one line of a bill we can move forward. 
Because if you agree that teachers need more pay, and I agree that teachers need more pay, I might believe that they deserve, which I do believe they deserve $65,000 a year minimum starting pay, and you believe they need a, a pay increase, okay, cool. So let's write a bill that will actively focus on incremental. If I can't get my immediately $65,000 pay increase, I mean, fine. But let's work on a bill that will actively incrementally, if not completely, increase um, you know, teacher funding or teacher pay. Uh, or in regards to, you know, help focusing on student loans, for example, for our educators. You know, they spend so much time building our next generation, but yet they have very little to show for it in respect to um, the state assisting them. So let's do a, a, a loan forgiveness program. Every two years that they do, let's 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 let's, let's decrease let's um, decrease their student loans at, the, at on a state level at Georgia. You know, let's 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 put, let's put money behind that. And they might not say they might say, well, I don't want to do every two years. Let's do every four. How about every three years? Regardless of the fact, we're gonna make this happen, whether you like it or not. We're going to find a way because we both seem to have the same general idea of wanting to make something happen. Let's just see at what point, how far are you willing to go? To, 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 to make this thing happen. And obviously at some point you have to stand on, on your morals and understand, stand on your, or your principles and not budge. That's something that I want people to understand. There's a difference between compromising um, and conceding and I refuse to concede. So that's definitely something that I, I would say that I'm bringing in regards to the state legislature is me being so young uh, is, is pushing for true bipartisanship to actually get something done for the South and, uh, and Georgia as a whole. And that's something that's really big that we are missing uh, specifically across, um, you know, in our, in our Georgia legislature is that true bipartisanship because we have this weird uh, fantasy of, of wanting to block one another from actually making things in Georgia easier for the people that live here. You mentioned that about education and raising teacher salaries. And I feel like every year we see teachers striking because of low salaries. And you also mentioned that both Democrats and Republican, which I probably agree with, is that we all want better educators. And you mentioned raising their um, income. So what do you think, how do you, first of all, how do you think that that would be received by your community? And then how do you think that that would actually impact the amount of teachers, the quality of teachers that you receive um, within your community? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, my poll platform, I make sure I talk that to talk talk to all my all the people that live in the city, uh, everybody in the community. I make sure I communicate what we're trying to do. And uh, every time I say we want to do $65,000, $65,000 starting uh, price for teachers, you know, pay. And they were just like, oh, yes, amen. <laughs> we need that. You know, there's always an excitement behind it. But there's always an excitement in something that you're trying to achieve, um, you know, and that's obviously going to bring something that we've never seen to Georgia before, which is it probably will bring an influx of teachers and, and actually increase teacher retention because we're showing that we're actively wanting to be, you know, want our teachers to grow. Uh, I guess the only drawback in regards to this is that it would take, you know, uh, you know, the hand of God to make sure that we can be consistent and not short selling our communities uh, once we get to the state legislature, but we're gonna make it happen. Um, I do have high hopes that we can make it happen and actually providing our teachers with something stable um, because they are not only, you know, we have to remember they're not playing just the role of the teacher, they're playing the teacher of the role of the mom, dad, counselor, protector, uh, you know, the, the, you know, you know, chef, you know, whatever they have to do, they are doing that in the classroom. And, and you know, uh, just me recently, I saw uh, an old uh, teacher of mine and, you know, just me having that conversation with him really brought back the memories of how, you know, he really, you know, I would say was a big staple in my life uh, while I was in school. And because of those big staples, we have to ensure that we're giving back to our teachers uh, that gave so much to us, uh, me coming from an education, uh, a lot of my families are educators, you know, that definitely hits home for me is ensuring that we do have, you know, where we do have their back the way that they had ours, uh, even in the, the worst of times. Yes. What? Me and Henry keep talking over each other. This is like back in college. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Henry. Literally, literally. <laughs> um, I just like considering you come from a family of educators um, and you kind of deeply are rooted in like the politics here, what uh, advice would you give someone that's maybe considering like running, but they don't have the experience or expertise as yourself? Um, understand what the job is that you're trying to go for. Uh, once you understand what it is, you can probably navigate it better. Um, like if you want to run for, let's say city, city uh, council, you know, know what that job entails, you know, don't just run there expecting you to just, you know, have absorbent amounts of power, because that's not how that works. We live in a, you know, in a democracy, which means we have to deal with other people and their beliefs, which is a good thing. 
um, but also understanding that it's a good thing. It's a challenging thing because everybody has different personalities and some strong, some are stronger than others. So understand what you're getting into. And also um, I would say, and I'm not sure if there's a, if this is a, you know, people are religious, but, you know, stay close to God. You know, this is one of those spaces where, you know, you have to stay close to God uh, or you'll, you'll lose it. Uh, a lot of, a lot of darkness, a lot of evil, you know, sits within politics just because of, of what you're doing. Um, and you're, 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 what you're doing will be affecting millions of people. And so stay close to God, pray on it, understand what the job is and just go for it. You don't gain any points by not going for it. You don't get any points in heaven for not going for it. So go for it. Worst case, worst, worst case scenario, you lose and you can learn from it. Best case scenario, you win and you can grow within it. Regardless, you have to take that jump. You can't afford to, you know, especially now where we are at politically, you can't afford not to take that leap. Um, especially if you want to see a better tomorrow or see tomorrow, you know, we have to make sure we have leaders that are willing to take that plunge and take that jump into this, this game. I love that. Um, so Joshua, so we're going to pivot to kind of just some quick rapid fire questions before we Let's uh, pivot. close Let's out. Pivot. So the question that I want to ask you, favorite social media app to use on the campaign trail, what gets you the most engagement? Uh, Instagram, because my TikTok is used to talk about the Lord. So <laughs> I don't talk about uh, uh, politics on, on TikTok. So no, uh, Instagram for sure. That's sh that's shocking, considering actually how much like I feel like TikTok is growing. I feel like everybody's like, yeah, trying to, like, grow their platform on TikTok. That's good to know. Feel free to drop your TikTok now so people can get their daily. For sure. For sure. Do I, have to, do, I, do I say it or type it? I'm not sure. No, say, it. say it for, for people. Oh, to find so you. it's uh, so my uh, Instagram and TikTok are the same. I am Joshua Anthony. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's, it's, that's pretty much the same. They're one and the same. There it is. All right. Next rapid fire. So what question, I mean, what question, what song do you listen to on the campaign trail? Or is there anything that you listen to or watch before you have to give a speech or just to hype you up and give that motivation, give yourself motivation? Um, No, I just kind of get into it. I just kind of make it. I guess that's what it is. I feel like we're in a space. Listen, listen, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. The reason why I don't is because I feel like the extra noise provides too much, like it, you know, it gives, it's too much in my brain. So I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna just do it. And then it happens and a lot of stuff, you know, and I know a lot of times it goes well. So we just kind of take the jump and, you know, whatever happens, happens. So I don't listen to music before I go into anything. Um, I normally sit quietly by myself and just kind of let, you know, let the Lord do what he's gonna do. And then, then from there we just get into it. So no, I don't listen to music before, but like when I'm just out and about um, knocking doors, you know, I may listen to a little bit of Kendrick Lamar, a little bit of Caleb Gordon. Uh, you know, just a little bit of mixture of everything. Okay, I'm like a bit of country too. A little bit of country too. You are Southern soul, my boy. <laughs> like I can feel it. <laughs> I so feel it. So like, considering that uh, you are so deeply enthroned with your religious practice, how often do you like read the Bible? Oh, every day. That's pretty cool. I um, yeah, I got to. I can't make it out. I can't make it out. And in the days that I don't, I'm a little like ah, something's missing. <laughs> my thumb's not right. But um, you know, uh, you know, that's definitely something that I try to my best to do is to read every single day. Um, I'll ask um one more if anyone else has another. They can feel free. Let's do um, it. I'm I'm liking these rapid fires. Current and um, I guess previous past generation politician who you who you view as like an idol or you, or as you view to someone, I want my political, or, you know, I envision my political career, like this person. It's kind of like, you know, who is the people who influence you as you are preparing to enter public life? <laughs> who else in public life has kind of been your, this is the person that I'm trying to, I think this person does it right. Um, that's a great question. Um, so influence, definitely Obama, because I was old enough to comprehend what was going on right but you're 21 so um, what, were you like four when you got elected like i mean i'm 28 turning 29 so i mean like this eight year listen, difference seven year difference is crazy <laughs> listen it had listen it was definitely um uh, obama in regards to you know that initial influence and me seeing what uh, a black man can do and you know seeing how high we can go um and and i would guess i would say this to an extent is that the people that really impacted my life as well um though they were political but not didn't necessarily hold office for leaders like uh, Malcolm X, um, leaders like, um, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a, of, 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 a, of a good name that I actively, you know, consistently talk about, um, you know, leaders like, 
like even even uh more recently uh like uh like i like judge like judge brown you know uh not brown uh jackson you know things of that nature um you know for me i don't want to be like any of them <laughs> that's just like you know i don't want to model any career as a matter of fact i don't even want to be in this field forever i don't want to model my career after anybody because we all bring something unique and i want some that i want people to hear that that's listening is that you all bring something unique. do not try to model yourself after anybody because you can't you can only be the best you you can't be the second upcoming of obama you can't be the second coming of of um of, of john lewis you can't be the you know but what you can do is be the best version of yourself and you'll bring something that they couldn't bring to the table you know and they were able to set the stage so that you could do that and so i don't want to model myself after anybody i just hope that i'm able to make an impact that when i'm long gone people are like yeah joshua definitely did what he needed to do to make things a little bit better for, for society you know i, I don't, I don't want to be a footnote in history Wait, you mentioned before we go, you mentioned that you don't see yourself in this field forever. So you say you have a five year plan. Where do you see yourself after you're elected or when you're done with being in pol politics? Where do you see yourself being? Uh, on an island. <laughs> I'm playing. Um, so no. So um, no, seriously, I, I feel like this is something that we have to understand. And I feel like we've, we've not done it properly. Uh, this politics is not supposed to be a forever game. Um, that's how you hold on to old ideals and can't move into a better future. Um, so me, you, you know, if God wants me to go to another stage, I'll go to another stage, but I'm not trying to do this more than about, you, you might get 10 years out of me. Let's be honest. You might get 10 years. You may, let's not, let's, let's just be, let's focus on a five years at a time. We're going to do it five years at a time, but you know, this is definitely not something that I want to do forever. Um, and in the future, whatever God has for me, be that me going higher or me just being able to assist others in regards to what they want to do. Uh, I want to be a part of that mission. I definitely want to stay um, assisting in, in in policy, but I definitely don't want to sit in office uh, until I'm 75 and I can barely breathe. I'm good. <laughs> it's not for me. Well, I think that's a great place um, to end for us. So I think before we close out, before we kind of do our thing, Joshua, please tell folks how to get in contact. But most importantly, because this is a campaign and we are being honest, tell folks where to release the funds and give you money so you can actually go knock on those doors and print those t-shirts I, I like this guy i like this guy we need money all right guys we, we need a lot of money no uh we do need a lot of money that wasn't a joke i was just being sarcastic but i do need the money um so for me uh, my name is joshua anthony once again i'm a 21 year old 21 year old running um for state house district 153 down here in southwest georgia in albany um and you know you can find my website at i am joshua anthony.com um, you know, our Instagram is I am Joshua Anthony. <laughs> our Twitter is I, I'm, so no A this time, I'm Joshua Anthony. Um, but we would love to have that support. And you can actually donate to the campaign via the website at I am Joshua And I appreciate all of you all for the support. Um, and you guys just allowing me to come up here and see with you all today. Um, I'm definitely going to be a frequent, a frequent watcher moving forward to what everything you guys uh, have going on. And the feeling is mutual. So thank you for both joining us. Thank you for both, I think, the work that you are doing um, and the work that you will do, because we're going to speak that into existence here. So thank once you. again, that is Joshua Anthony running uh, for House in Georgia. Be sure to connect with him and be sure to connect with us. You can watch this video in full on YouTube at WRGO Pod. You can also listen, like, and subscribe on all of our streaming platforms. That includes Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen uh, to your podcast. Be sure to also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at WRGOPod. Until next time, thanks.